Well, welcome to session 10. We're going to be focusing today on a place that most of us never really want to go, either as visitors or as participants. And we're going to focus on jail and detention center care. Now, we say that with a laugh and a chuckle, but the reality is that uh, many of us, you know, we, we may have had family members uh, that have uh, wound up there. And we say family members because none of us are going to admit to having uh, wound up there. But, uh, you know, incarceration does occur. Uh, it can be a few too many drinks. It can be a bankruptcy situation. It could be any number of things. Even this past uh, couple of days, I heard and read a story of a Major League Baseball player. And maybe you heard this story. Major League Baseball player who earns $400,000 a year was arrested for shoplifting six shirts that cost $60. I didn't say $60 a piece. I mean $60 total. Six shirts, $10 a piece, makes $400,000 a year arrested for shoplifting. And so we want to think um, today in terms of uh, how we minister to people who uh, are incarcerated, who are going through a jail uh, or detention center kind of case, or even prison type ministry. But I want you to imagine with me as we get going into session 10 today, what feelings you might have if you knew that you could spend the rest of your life in an 8 by 8 jail cell. A little less than a year ago, um, I had the opportunity to take my uh, family, my wife and my children, to San Francisco, California. And you can't go to San Francisco, California without taking a tour of probably the most famous prison uh, in our country, and that's Alcatraz. And uh, I found myself trying to envision on that tour what life would be like living on what was called The Rock. And maybe you watched that old uh, Sean Connery movie, The Rock, the Nicolas Cage movie, The Rock, or even go back even further than that, and the old Clint Eastwood flick, Escape from Alcatraz, and you remember some of the pictures uh, in that story. And it was fascinating for me to walk the uh, block, A block, B block, C block of Alcatraz, and see the bars and see the uh, concrete walls and try to envision and imagine what it would be like to be incarcerated in these very small uh, eight foot by eight foot, seven foot ceiling cells where you're caught uh, and the sink take up the bulk of the place and realize that you've got to spend 23 out of 24 hours uh, in that small amount of space. And then to walk into what was called D block, which was the solitary confinement area, and have someone shut the door on you in D block where you couldn't see your hand in front of your face and realize the limitations to our own personal freedom and the feelings that would come with that and the fear that would accompany uh, that being the reality of life. And so realize this, that in our mission, our mission is to build that caring relationship with the hope of gaining permission to share the life-changing good news of Jesus Christ. And the key word in our mission statement relative to Session 10 in jail and detention center care is the word permission. Because while we have all of those accompanying feelings and all of that fear and that concern from being in that small uh, session, I'll give you a piece of encouragement as a caregiver. Permission is something you're going to get because you have a captive audience. (laughs) All right? They're not going anywhere. Not soon. And so the opportunity as you begin to reach out and minister to someone who is in jail is that you have the opportunity to very easily and very frequently and very often gain their permission to guess what? Bring God into their situation. Because while they can't escape freedom and they can't get outside the bars of that uh, cell, they can experience the freedom that can come in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so we look at gaining permission. Now, in jail ministry, recognize this, that jails and detention centers, they're they're typically short-term holding facilities. And the people that are there, they were somewhere else just a few days ago. And so it's not a long-term facility. You're walking into situations where your ministry there, it may be short-term, it may be a little bit long-term, it may sometimes be longer-term than you'd like, but recognize that you're going to have the opportunity to gain that permission to, uh, to share the good news of Christ. Now, the bridge that we want to talk about is how we care for those in our community who are facing legal issues, incarceration, and interaction with the court system. And we're going to look at either or and both. Now, a special note 
And you'll remember that we've been covering this special note throughout our sessions. That when we're helping people with marriage problems, we want to be ready to refer them to a marriage counselor. When we're helping someone with a drug and alcohol problem, we want to help them get the treatment that they need. And the same holds true when we're helping someone who is incarcerated to recognize our role as a caregiver. We are that. We're someone who's wanting to offer care. We want to help them through the process, but guess what we're not? We are not attorneys. We're not there to offer legal advice, legal counsel. We are there to be an encourager. We're there to listen. We're there to help them. And realize this, that when you go in and begin ministering into jail situations, for most of us, for most of us that's going to be a ministry that's going to get us way outside of our comfort zone. It, it, let's face it, the Wake County Jail, the county where we reside, the, the county where this session is being taught, you may be watching it on video, so you may live in another county, another part of the country. But the Wake County Jail is not a place that any of us want to visit very frequently. No county jail is a place you want to visit very frequently. There's always challenges to go in and out and to be able to have some face time with those who are, uh, who are incarcerated. But what we're not is we're not attorneys. We're caregivers. We're there to help them through the immediate crisis of a situation and know uh, how to help and, and what to do. So let's run through some of the very practical. Page 123, page 124 of your care guide. What do we do when someone is facing legal trouble? Remember our ministry formula, time plus talk, plus transparency, plus trials equals trust. Now let me point out one thing about uh, that formula. That when you're walking through caregiving and helping someone facing legal trouble, it is not always, nor is it maybe even often, that they are going to be completely transparent with you. You say, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. When you walk in to visit someone in the jail, it is going to be very often the case where you hear from them, I shouldn't be here. Or, I didn't do it. And guess what? Our role, the role that we get to play, we're not their police officer, we're not their judge, and we're not their jury. And so we don't have to pass judgment on whether they deserve to be there or don't deserve to be there. We don't even have to pass judgment on whether they're being transparent with us and telling us the truth or not being transparent with us and not telling us the truth. We're not their attorney. We're not their judge. We're not their jury. We're there to care for them and we're there to help. So here's our opportunities for ministry. They include many. And we're going to walk through different things uh, about the legal process that we want to be familiar with. Number one, our opportunity is to visit the incarcerated. That can sound, in some cases, a lot easier in words than it is in, actual act, in, in putting it into action. Visiting someone that is incarcerated can always be a challenge because oftentimes visitation is restricted to two or three people. Uh, immediate family member, uh, an ordained minister, or legal counsel. And if you are a community caregiver, a community chaplain who does not possess ordination, you may get shut out of that process. So you may be limited in being able to visit the incarcerated. That may be a situation where as a community chaplain, a community caregiver, you need to try to involve someone else uh, who is an ordained minister or someone else who can facilitate some ministry uh, in the life of that person uh, so that they can visit the incarcerated uh, and you can help facilitate some ministry there. That doesn't mean that you're shut out of ministry. Because look at the other opportunities. You, you have the opportunity to visit the family of the incarcerated. If someone has been arrested and jailed on a DWI charge, it's affecting more than just that person. They, they may have children, they may have a spouse, others that it's impacting. And so you want to visit the family and help minister to them and care for them. You are not prevented from appearing at the bond hearing or a trial phase. And so the court system itself is always a public venue, and that's a place where you can show up on an immediate hearing and you can be a familiar face. You can be someone who is in their corner, so to speak. Someone who is offering them just a shoulder of support, a face of support. Someone that really wants to care for them through this process. So a way and opportunity of ministry is to appear at the bond hearing or the trial phase. And then finally, caring for the incarcerated and the family, no matter the outcome. Realize this, jail stays and court ministry, it's usually not a quick process. Jail stays in court ministry and court involvement, it can take place over numbers of weeks and months. 
and it will happen sporadically. You may be deeply involved one or two or three days, and then your opportunities for ministry may fade to the background, and then it may cycle back up with a court appearance or, or that kind of case. And so recognize that it can be, it can be sporadic. Um, think about some verses. Because one of the things we always want to do is lay some biblical foundation in a place that we can point people to when we're ministering to them. And remember earlier I made that statement, when you're gaining permission, you have a captive audience. Listen to some verses that that captive audience may really want to hear. Uh, Listed on page, uh, I believe, 123, 124 in your book, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You're pointing them toward a spiritual freedom that while they may not be physically free from the confines of the jail, they can be spiritually free through a relationship with God that's found through Jesus Christ. And then think about these words of Jesus that we find in John chapter 8 verse 34 through 36 where Jesus replies and He says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to what? Sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so we're pointing people toward the spiritual freedom that we, that we can have that's in and through a relationship with God. Now let me hit the pause button in our teaching for just a minute and give you an example, an illustration. I mentioned Alcatraz a little earlier. And, and I could tell you so many different stories after having toured Alcatraz. Uh, but, but one of those stories that, that I found most fascinating were the number of escape attempts that occurred over the history of Alcatraz operating as a federal penitentiary. There were 14 different escape attempts over the history of uh, Alcatraz operating as a federal penitentiary. Number 13 escape attempt was the one that was detailed in the movie Escape from Alcatraz that many of you may recall Clint Eastwood starring in. And Clint Eastwood played the role of a man named Frank Morris and two other escapees, uh, brothers Clarence and Jim Anglin. And here's what that story unfolds. That story in the movie and in the story that they tell you in the tour of Alcatraz is that those three gentlemen, Frank Morris, Clarence, and John Anglin, were the only three people to never be found following an escape attempt from Alcatraz. The official story, if you ever tour Alcatraz, is that there's never been a successful escape attempt from Alcatraz. But those three guys were never found. They were never found living or dead. Now here's what I found myself thinking about as I heard that story. And yes, I had to rent the movie. It was 1978, I was 10. I had to rent the movie and watch it one more time. And here's what I found myself thinking as I heard that story told on the Alcatraz tour. That if those guys really were successful in their escape attempt, they had to live the rest of their known lives running and wondering if they would ever be caught. And so in reality, they may have been free of the confines of Alcatraz, but they were never really free. They had to spend the rest of their lives running and hiding and wondering, is today the day I'm going to be be caught? And you realize that when we encounter and minister to people, what we're pointing them to, especially in a case where they're incarcerated, is we're pointing them to a reality that they can be set free from the slavery of their sin. They can be set free from the confines of a life lived apart from a relationship with God. And when we think about those words of Jesus and He says to us, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's where we bring our ministry back to in the life of someone that we might be caring for who's going through a jail stay or they're imprisoned over a long-term period of time. Let's take a look at some practical. Page 124, Detention Center Visits. We want to show up If we have the permission and the opportunity from the jail facility to visit, we want to show up and we want to offer a listening ear without, keyword here, judgment. Here are some things to recognize in the visitation process. Number one, the booking process itself may take several hours. People are usually not permitted during this time. The opportunity to visit requires very special access and awareness of policies. 
So wherever you happen to live, whether it's right here in Wake County or you're watching this on videotape, be aware of the visitation policies for the jail facilities in your particular area, your particular community. I will tell you that no uh, two jail center facilities are created equal. Even from county to county here in our state and in our locale, the visitation policies in Wake County are going to differ from those in Vance County. They're going to differ from those in uh, Alamance County, as, as different places that we go, Franklin County uh, and, and, and what have you. So realize that the, the, the process, the, the access and the awareness of the policies, it's all very different from place to place. Number three, because you want to have as much access as possible, if you discover in those policies that you can have that permission, go ahead and initiate the registration process so that you can be registered uh, as a uh, caregiver, as a minister that has the permission to, to visit. The last thing in the world you want to have to do is work through that registration process on top of having received the call that, of someone needing help. So in other words, you want to be proactive. You want to be prepared as much as possible so that when that call comes, you can intervene. Uh, overview of the legal process just very quickly because we don't bump up against this each and every day. It may not be a, a, a process that we're familiar with, but here's what you can expect with someone who's facing charges. You can expect, A, number one, a charging phase which usually occurs outside the courtroom, and it may be simply the, uh, the charges from the police officer. In some cases, it could be magistrates or it could be warrants that are being, arrested, uh, being issued. So there's a charging phase. The second is a pretrial phase. And in this particular arena, people may or may not get out of jail. So in a pretrial phase, if they have posted bail, they could be out of the jail facility. If they're unable to post bail or the bail has been set so high, they may remain in jail and you're able to minister to them through that process through a, a form of a weekly visitation or a, a weekly contact or if you don't have access to the facility to, for, through ministry with and to their family. Then finally there's the trial itself which is the actual fact-finding process where both sides are presenting evidence. This is, the kind, this is the phase that we're most familiar with watching television shows like Matlock. Or, or other uh, courtroom type uh, cases where we see them in the trial phase and that's the part where they're able to uh, they're able to try the case present the evidence and, and get the person uh, either out of the uh, verdict or, or sentence in about 22 minutes right that's the way it always plays out on uh, on Matlock it, you know you take all the commercials out and they can uh, Matlock can work some magic pretty fast you know now, everybody knows that Matlock's still running on reruns right if you think it's not Get sick and stay home from work one day with the flu. You, you can probably watch 18 different episodes of Matlock. You just have to pick your channel. And, and so realize the trial phase there. Sentencing phase, it's where the person is rendering the verdict. They're saying guilty or not guilty. If you can't be at any other part of, the, of, of ministry in the life of someone who's facing a, a, a jail sentence or a possible prison sentence, be at the sentencing phase. It is an intense time of emotion for the person, and not only the person, but their family. And you can be the person that can walk with them through that process and help them uh, know how to, uh, how to respond. Uh, you can be there to pray with their family, to pray for their family, and, and so be ready for that. Now, uh, we're going to skip past the bond hearing. That material is there for you to read uh, and, and think about, but let's look at offering some practical help. I want you to think through ideas because one of the things we're always wanting to be about is how can we offer practical assistance with whatever the person is, is uh, facing. Think about someone who was employed and working uh, yesterday. This is, we're shooting this video and we're having this class. It, today is a Wednesday. I want you to imagine with me they went to work on Monday. And they had a great day at work on Monday. They went and they had a great day at work on Tuesday. And so last night... They had such a great first couple of days, they decided to uh, go by the, uh, the, the restaurant and have a few too many drinks. And so on their way home from work, they end up having four, five, six drinks, and they pull out of the restaurant, and they pull right out in front of a police officer who picks them up on DWI. And they call you because you're their friend. And so now it's Wednesday morning, and they spent the night in jail on a very simple DWI charge, and the reason it's not as simple as a DWI charge is because you learn that it's like the fourth DWI charge. 
and they're not exactly going to let them go very quickly. So now there's a bell situation going on. And remember where they were on Monday and Tuesday? They were at work. But now it's Wednesday morning and they're in the jail. And they're not showing up at work. So think about practical ways that you can work and that you can help them. What if you could be the person to reach out to their employer? What if you could be the person to put the phone call through and let them know, is there a way they could get a short-term leave of absence? Now recognize confidentiality. What do you have to have before you can make that call? Their permission. But you're wanting to minister to them in a practical way. You're wanting to help them with something very practical because now they've, they've, they've been arrested. They're very likely going to lose their license. The last thing in the world right now they need on top of that is to lose the job. So if there's a way you can offer some practical assistance, it's huge. If they did get picked up on a DWI charge, where do you think their car happens to be? Your car's in an impound lot. And depending on what part of the country you live in, those impound lot fees can be anywhere from $50 to $70 a day. So have someone be incarcerated in jail for 10 days and their car be in an impound lot, then they've got to pay five to $700 to get it out of the impound lot. You want to know a practical way? Facilitate with their family to be the person to go get their car out of the impound lot. Will there be a fee to pay? Absolutely. Will it be less than it would be 10 days later? Absolutely. So you're looking for practical ways to, uh, to help them. And these are outlined for you on page 126. Your ability to help with the practical is only limited by your own imagination. And it's only limited by your ability to ask them the question, what are some things that I could do for you right now? And then have a willing heart to be willing to help them with those things that they need right now. And, and so it's not only the spiritual. We're not only wanting to minister to them and help them with the freedom that can be found in Christ. We're wanting to help them with the, con with the uh, very practical. Because one of the things that you get to convey when you help them with the very practical is a non-judgmental spirit. Remember our mission? We want to gain permission to share the good news of Christ and we want to do it in a non-threatening manner. We want to come alongside people and help them in a way that doesn't threaten them, that, that helps them. And so we want to be ready to, uh, to do that. Now, one caution I would give you, and we're going to look at the bail process. I would caution you about contributing personal funds to the securing of a car out of impound or to the securing of bail in the, uh, in the bail process. Let's look at the bail process, and I'll give you a word of caution on why we caution against that. Check out the bail process on page 126. Envision for just a minute that somebody, a uh, bail is set at, uh, in example two here, $10,000. And they contact a bail bondsman, and that bail bondsman is going to charge a 15% fee or $1,500. That means the amount of money that has to be presented to the bail bondsman is $1,500 for the person to be bailed out, and that's the total responsibility. Now, if the person doesn't show, guess what the responsibility is? It's the full $10,000. So if you put your personal funds at risk and you're the person that posts the $1,500, you're not going to get that, you're never going to get that $1,500 back. You're absolutely not going to get that back, but you could be at risk for having to be responsible for the $10,000. And so we caution against ever putting your own personal finances at risk. You can help facilitate the process. You can help them brainstorm ways they can come up with their own bail money. They may have retirement funds. They may have a savings account. They may have family members that have the means to be able to help them. And so be careful about the contribution of, uh, of personal uh, funds and personal bail. Page 127, what about when bail is not possible? Either it's set too high or it's not even set at all. Look at some practical ways you can minister. You can bring the person things uh, like toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, uh, soap, shampoo. In many cases, uh, jail facilities will have uh, stores, places that these, these items can be purchased, but they may need money on an account. The place where you could contribute small amounts of money, and I do mean small, $5, $10, $15, you can place that kind of money on an account where they can purchase things uh, that would be made available to them in the, uh, in the jail system. You say, how in the world do you learn all this? Uh, you ask. You ask very practical questions. You're wanting to help people with the things that they need and in the way that they need you to help with them. Page 128, 
What happens if you're ever called to testify in court? I want to give you a, a, a very concrete example and a kind of a case study in this. And, um, and, and it actually, I, I give it to you in two different parts, and I think you'll get a kick out of part number one and, and uh, not a great kick out of part number two. But if you're ever called to testify in court, here are some basic pointers. Number one, you want to speak loudly enough to be heard, especially if there's no microphones that are available. Um, it's often very important that you put your own comments in writing so that you can order your own thought process. Um, you may want to confer with the person's lawyer uh, so that the attorney is going to be aware of what it is you want to say uh, and why it is you want to say it. Um, always introduce yourself, either before, the, uh, before court or through the client's attorney so that you can let them know you're there to support this person. You're going to want to let them know how you know them. So if you are serving as a community chaplain and you've gotten to know someone by serving in your neighborhood or your child's school, you want to introduce how you have that connection. Because the, um, the judge may be looking at you saying, what in the world do you have to do with this case? Uh, I heard from one of our corporate chaplains serving out in Arizona just within the past week uh, how he was able to minister to a, uh, an employee. And he actually showed up to court with this particular guy. And you know what his charge was? His, char his charge was shoplifting a 12-pack of beer at a convenience store. And he ministered to this guy, and he encouraged this guy to do two things. One, go to the store, to the manager, and apologize. And he did. And the store manager dropped the charges. And so he still had to appear in court. And so when he appeared in court, the chaplain accompanied him to court. And the, and the judge allowed the chaplain to speak. And the chaplain was able to speak and say, here's what we did. And we went to the store manager, and the store manager agreed to drop the charges and, and the steps that were taken. And the judge looked him in the eye, the fellow who had lifted the 12-pack of beer, and said, I want you to keep talking with this chaplain. And don't come back in my court. <laughs> All right? And so if, if we can come alongside, sometimes we can facilitate an overwhelmed justice system. All right? That doesn't mean we're trying to keep people from getting the justice that they deserve. Our justice system is overwhelmed. We're trying to support and help people and get them pointed to a, on a road that we can go. So always, always introduce yourself. Speak with the person you're caring for. Gain permission. Have your facts straight. Know the situation. Always tell the truth. That may sound odd. All right, but I always tell the truth. You are uh, in 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 some cases you may be offering character testimony. In some cases you may be offering testimony under oath. Be brief and to the point. Say it and sit down. Right. And, and so uh, if you are being examined, cross-examined, if you're being asked questions, answer the questions asked, not the questions not being asked. All right. So be careful there. Uh, be courteous and mindful. Uh, of the system, uh, always address the court with your honor. It doesn't make a difference if they're male, female, young, old. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're older than you or younger than you. You address them as your honor. And so we want to conduct ourselves in the, uh, in the right protocol. Now, an example. Let's put it into action. Let's talk about jail ministry and let's talk about court ministry. Because the two can sometimes be separate and they can be one step of a long process and there can be different points of highs and lows. And, and so if you get that permission to be able to walk in and make that visit, recognize that two things. One, they're a captive audience, right? And number two, there may be other ministries going on within the walls of that jail system. One of the great things that I admire about the Christian church, and I put that in quotes, the Christian church at large, is generally you will find in almost every county jail across our country uh, a ministry of outreach from some local church or some ministry that exists to reach out specifically to those in jail. And I would encourage you, learn about those and partner with them. Because they've got a much longer term ministry. You may just have one or two people that you're helping and they're going to be there for a while. Watch this play out. Had opportunity a number of years back an entirely different state than where we are right now, entirely different city. And a young man, about uh, six months, nine months after 9-11, um, make uh, not a great comment about bringing a gun to school. And, and that, not after 9-11, I misspoke, after the Columbine shootings uh, in Colorado, about nine months after the Columbine shootings. And gang, 
in that era of time, if you made a comment about bringing a gun to school, they took it very seriously. Still do today. And this young man wound up being in the Department of Juvenile Justice System. And I began to walk through that process with the family and try to reach out and get him the, uh, the help that he needs. And I remember sitting down on about the second visit and beginning to have a conversation with him and sharing with him some of the verses and talking with him about Jesus setting him free and, and him giving me permission to share the good news. And I'm getting excited because he's very interested and he's listening and he's understanding and he's asking questions. And, 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 and you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking the son's getting ready to set him free. I, I, I'm thinking that. I'm, I'm getting really excited because I know he's here and he's listening. He's captive. i got a captive audience. And, and, and I'm thinking the son's getting ready to set him free. And so when I reach that point where I ask him the question, and gang, it's a question we want to ask. Would, would you like to have a relationship with God? And I'm using a little booklet called Steps to Peace with God that I'm sharing with him about. And I ask him the question, would, where, where would you see yourself at in this picture? Would you see yourself in relationship with God or separated from God? And he said, well, you know, uh, Sunday night or Sunday afternoon, I would have seen myself here. And he pointed to the place of being separated from God. But, but now I would see myself over here. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, Sunday night, some church was here and they had a service and I prayed that prayer. And so when I tell you there are other ministries going on that we want to work with, now I was excited because I thought I was getting ready to see this young man come into relationship with Christ. But it didn't disappoint me that it had already happened. And so look around you. There are other ministries going on that you can partner with and we want to be about that. Now, fast forward. I wished I could tell you that when that case went to court, that it had a great, great, great outcome. Okay, in, in that case with that particular young man, I was able to stand up and offer testimony and they still required him to serve some time. Was it less? I believe so. But it, he still served time. But I was able to walk through, tell the story about the steps the young man had taken and try to get the, uh, the help that he needed. Caregiving when the case is adjudicated. Page uh, 128, 129. Just realize this. It is one of those situations where the person and you as a caregiver, you have absolutely no control. You know, we love situations where we're in control. We despise those situations that are really out of our control. And this is one of them. And, and so be ready at the end to offer the care no matter what the outcome is. You may be trying to encourage a person who is found guilty. Or you may be trying to encourage a family whose loved one is found guilty and you don't even get the opportunity to say a word to the person charged and, 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 uh, and found guilty. You may get um, the charge of innocent or not guilty and you may have some wonderful opportunity to think about and present ideas on the justice of God and, and, and forgiveness and, and the freedom that, that comes. And so just be recognizing that uh, there are different responses on the, uh, on the case being adjudicated. Uh, we can't get very far. We're getting ready to wrap up this session. We have covered separation and divorce. Uh, we've talked about caregiving and marriage relationships. We do want to come back to that in this session because it is one more arena that could bring you into court cases. And so just a couple of comments on that. Uh, recognize separation and divorce. Be ready to point people toward the Scriptures and what the Scriptures say about, the, uh, about, about separation and divorce. But page 130, I want you to think about the legalities of divorce and walking through a caregiving session with someone who's struggling with that. And while uh, statutes are different from state to state, um, you see some bullet points about no-fault divorce and at-fault divorce and, and recognize and be familiar with what your state itself uh, talks about. But look at the caregiving opportunity in a, uh, in a situation. When somebody's walking through a divorce and separation issue and it's beyond the marriage being saved. In other words, it's past you being able to intervene and help them with the marriage. They're done. You're walking with them through the divorce itself. Here are some issues that you may be navigating with them. The division of property, personal and real estate, uh, child custody issues, uh, child support, who pays and how much, uh, alimony in cases that uh, involve fault or grounds, uh, or grounds for the uh, breakup of the marriage, and then finally insurance and other special matters. Here's what you want to do. You want to avoid offering legal advice in those cases, and as they're working through a settlement, you want to avoid offering an opinion of whether or not they got a good settlement or a bad settlement. 
What you are is the person to walk with them through that process, to be a listening ear, to be a sounding board. Um, if they have to go to court, those court cases are not happy times. You know, you think about the happiest day that that marriage probably ever experienced was probably the day they stood before a pastor or someone who, uh, who united them in a covenant relationship. And you fast forward, I've always found myself sitting in those kind of cases wondering how it got here. And now they're at the worst day. And they just need a friend. They need somebody to show up because they're in a battle that's not fun. And what we're doing is we're showing up and we're caring for them uh, no matter what. We're walking with them in a situation that has no hope of reconciliation. And so just those are basics relative to court and caregiving uh, and jail ministry. The good news, it is not something that happens every day. Because if it did, it would take a lot of time. You, you, there are entire ministries that are dedicated to it. We'll get involved for short periods of time. We want to help, uh, but it doesn't happen every day. Bridge builders and bridge burners, and we'll wrap up this session. Bridge builders, page 130. Be the one to reach out with a visit to jail. Be the person that can point people to free or low-cost legal assistance. Be the encourager. Be the encourager to encourage them towards Scripture. Encourage them toward the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So be that person. And finally, the bridge burners. We said them a couple of times in this session. Bridge burners for this session would be to assume the role of judge and jury. We're not. And number two, ignore the practical help that's needed. Those things that we could do that won't change where they are, but it might just lighten the load a little bit as they walk through the problem. You've got an uh, audio disc on jail and detention center care. It gives you a number of different scenarios, a number of different uh, problems that people may encounter, and gives you some ideas on how you can offer care in those kind of situations. encourage you to listen to that a number of times uh, in this coming week. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we acknowledge to you that we all have been incarcerated by our sin. And Jesus, we thank you that uh, you have set us free. Lord, prepare our hearts and our minds um, for someone that may be facing a jail sentence. They may be um, reaching out to us on that DWI charge or that uh, domestic violence uh, charge or some other issue. Give us sensitive hearts. Help us to understand how we can offer your care, how we can offer your compassion. And Lord, recognize that judgment is not something that we need to bring. That Lord, forgiveness is something you want to bring. And so we trust you to work and help us and prepare our hearts and our minds uh, for jail and detention center ministry. We trust you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Questions I can answer. All right, great point. Uh, the comment was uh, from someone who has worked in jail uh, service for over 18 years. You probably know more about jail ministry than, than we can even begin to, uh, to hit upon. But uh, there, there are and will be uh, some jail facilities where there are chaplains, uh, either volunteer or staff, that you can interact with. And in this particular case, chaplain needed to be familiar with uh, different faith perspectives. And, and Yang recognized that, that you will be navigating the fact that people do come at life from different, you know, different faith perspectives. So as we offer ministry, we are dealing with that. I'm not going to delve into it very much uh, in answer to this question. We're going to focus on that quite a bit in session 11 of people who are kind of approaching life from different faith perspective. But do be aware there can be chaplains on staff or there can be chaplains uh, that you can deal with and then also other uh, jail and prison ministries. Uh, how many of you are familiar with um, Prison Fellowship Ministry, Chuck Colson's uh, ministry? That, that's a great website, one to be familiar with and, and to know what they have to offer. Another question. Generally, in a hospital setting, you don't need uh, credentials. Um, you, you do in some facilities for critical uh, care departments and ICU departments, uh, but typical visits, no, you don't need credentials. They help, but they're not required. And some hospitals will require you to have a badge uh, and, and to register with them. So each hospital will be different. Um, but if you're showing up um, as a friend kind of as a caregiver in a role, you're not going to need those kind of credentials. Uh, jail facilities are 
fairly intense in their requirement for credentials. Um, Wake County Jail, where we happen to be, if you're watching this on video or, or, or looking at the questions, um, requires ordination. Uh, as a or yeah, immediate family member, and you can only have one or two designated immediate family members. So it's not like uh, cousins, brothers, uncles, aunts can visit. Uh, it's going to be one or two immediate family members. Not uh, not the easiest of ministries, and one that on a volunteer basis, it's very easy for the jail facility to shut us out of uh, from a volunteer standpoint. But gang, don't let that prevent you because you got ministry to the family. There's so many other ways. If um, if there are roadblocks coming up in one arena of ministry, I always look at it as God giving you another opportunity. God, God's moving you in a different direction. Think about the Apostle Paul. At the end of his life, where was he wanting to go and minister? He said he wanted to go to Spain. You know? And he tried, and, and if you look at Paul's ministry in the book of Acts, he, he says, I tried to go here and the Spirit prevented me. You know, I always wonder, what, you know, why? You know? But, but there's always, you know, if, if there's a roadblock in one arena of ministry, it's because God's opening up a door for another.